Hi fellow seekers! This video marks the continuation of my current series on Topics I can research at home while the British Library remains in lockdown, as it so remains. Apparently, when it declared itself open to, and I quote, everyone on the 18th of May, what it actually meant was everyone willing to book three weeks in advance for a single day of access. Faced with having to concoct a topic on the fly, I did what I usually do in such straits and looked toward Anton Petrov for inspiration. Of the most recent prey his shark-like senses have detected in the information ocean, one that caught my eye was not so much a new discovery as a reinvention of our world, courtesy of the Gaia probe. This paper provided me with an opportunity to explore a topic I had been mulling over for years but never fully birthed. The Gaia probe is one of the most underappreciated spacecraft ever launched. Unlike its flashier cousins, such as the Hubble or James Webb, it has no grand sweeping vistas to offer, no great leaps in our understanding of physics. What it will do, once its data can be fully processed and comprehended, will be to grant the human race a far more detailed picture of its place in the universe. You'd think, if there was one existential quandary we'd have sorted in the last 100 years, it would be that. After all, what few tracts of our world remain unmapped are too removed from common experience for the average person to consider. Of said average people, most, with a few obvious exceptions, are aware of our planet's orbit around its sun. And its seven major companions, innumerable minor ones, and dozens of major moons, have now been at least photographed, and in many cases fully mapped. What tends to get glossed over in this conception is the relative distances. The orbital ring of the outermost asteroid belt, which marks the edge of the so-called inner solar system, is only 8 AU, or Earth-Sun distances, in diameter, which is less than the closest distance between Saturn and Uranus, or the width of the Kuiper belt, the icy belt where Pluto is. But that's nothing compared to the distance to the Oort cloud, the sphere of icy objects that enshrouds our solar system and from which our most distant comets emerge. It is believed to lie between 50 and 100,000 AU from the Sun, which makes it alone more than a thousand times the width of our known solar system, and a thousand times farther out. Yet even its maximum distance is still nothing to astronomers. Astronomers think in parsecs, and the 200,000 AU diameter of the Oort cloud barely equals one parsec. Astronomers measure the distance to stars using parallax, the apparent shift of a star's position by the angle of sight as the Earth moves around the Sun. A parsec is the distance at which a star's parallax is equal to one arc second, or a 3,600th of a degree. It is roughly equal to 3.26 light years, or 31 trillion kilometers. And the kicker? No star is as close as one parsec away. All have parallaxes smaller than one arc second. At this point, the average person's mental map becomes understandably blurry. I am sure the majority have at least heard of the Milky Way, and if they've watched enough documentaries, know that it comprises a gigantic, multi-armed spiral of 400 billion stars, 32,000 parsecs across and that our sun orbits the galactic center at roughly halfway to the edge. But the sheer scale of it can overwhelm our meager sense of proportion. As I said a few videos ago, we now know, or at least are relatively certain, that our galaxy contains four major spiral arms. The Sagittarius Carina arm, the Scutum Centaurus arm, the Perseus arm, and the Norma arm. Our Sun is currently wending its way through a surprisingly large offshoot of the Perseus arm called the Local or Orion arm. A thousand parsecs wide, three thousand parsecs long, and ten billion cubic parsecs in volume, the Orion arm, whilst larger than originally believed to be, is still a fairly small portion of our galaxy, comprising just 140 million stars, or about a twentieth the total. Nestled within the Orion arm, and comprising 40% of its length, is the Radcliffe Wave, a string of interstellar clouds that house the nurseries of thousands of young stars. The wave and its subsequent star formation are likely due to the ripples created when our galaxy devoured one of its smaller satellites. 
Only identified in 2020, the Radcliffe Wave was named not for an individual, but for the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, because the days of one person laying claim to a scientific discovery are long gone. Within the Radcliffe Wave, and only 40 parsecs from Earth, is the recently fledged group of baby stars known very scientifically as the Scorpius Centaurus Association, a roving gang of giant stars all between 10 and 15 million years old, or about a third of a percent the age of the Sun, with some, like Antares, already approaching the end of their lives. Gas from the stellar winds ejected by these giant stars eventually collides with an egg-shaped cloud of gas and dust aimed in its direction, known, for reasons that will soon become clear, as the local interstellar cloud. About 10 parsecs across and 10,000 cubic parsecs in volume, the local interstellar cloud is actually something of a freak in its neighborhood, most of which is taken up by a superheated cavity in the interstellar medium called the local bubble. About 50 parsecs across, the local bubble is believed to have formed from a series of supernovae in the Pleiades star cluster as it passed in our vicinity between 10 and 20 million years ago. The local interstellar cloud formed at the meeting point between the local bubble and the Loop 1 bubble, created by the hoodlums of the Scorpius Centaurus Association as they marauded their way through our region of space a few million years later. The local interstellar cloud is little more than a wisp of gas trapped on the wall of the bubble. Despite being six times denser than the gas within the bubble, it is still less dense than average for the interstellar medium, which, let me remind you, is just one atom per cubic centimeter. As you might have guessed, the reason the aforementioned interstellar cloud and bubble bear the name local is because, as of right now, our sun happens to be moving through them. It has occupied the local bubble for about the last 5 to 10 million years, and the local interstellar cloud for about 100,000 years. It is likely to remain within the cloud for about 3,000 more years, whereupon it will pass into the neighboring G-cloud. But of course, the sun is not alone. Like cars traveling in the night, the stars of the Milky Way flank, tail, and occasionally overtake each other as they make their own lonely journeys around the galaxy. From a human perspective, these journeys are shockingly fast. The sun travels at the mind-bending speed of 200 kilometers per second, or 720,000 kilometers per hour. Eventually, stars die, or pass into a different lane, or are kicked off course by a supernova, and the constellations considered immutable by civilization's past, will change. The night sky looked upon by the dinosaurs contained none of the stars we would recognize. But, from the perspective of the galaxy, these journeys are so glacial that they might as well be trapped in amber. It will take 11,000 years, for instance, for Ross 248 to overtake Proxima Centauri as the closest star to our sun. And here, at last, is where Anton's flag paper comes in. In May 2021, a joint European team employed Gaia data to create the most accurate map yet of our local stellar neighborhood. Defined as any star with a parallax larger than 100 milliarc seconds, which gave a maximum distance of 10 parsecs. They then combined the latest Gaia and exoplanet information with that contained in the Set of Identifications, Measurements, and Bibliography for Astronomical Data, or SIMBAD a database of over 11 million astronomical objects, both stellar and not, held at the Strasbourg Astronomical Data Center. After combing the results for false positives, the team produced a sphere of 339 star systems, comprising 540 individual objects, stars, white dwarfs, brown dwarfs, and exoplanets. Recognizing the huge potential for astronomical outreach, the team made the map available to the general public, whereupon I assume it was promptly bookmarked by every science fiction writer on Earth. Of course, this is nowhere near the full picture. The stars are probably filled in by this point, but there are many points on the map still empty. Gaia's upcoming fourth data release will reveal any new exoplanets. And beyond that, brown dwarfs, rogue planets, and possibly even more exotic objects may yet be found. Stars are classified according to their temperature using a somewhat rickety scale of O, B, A, F, G, K, and M, with O being the hottest and M the coolest. If you want to keep track, just remember, O, be a fine girl, kiss me. 
The Gaia Cephal contained none of the hottest stars of classes O and B, which is unsurprising because any such stars within ten parsecs would be by far the brightest objects in the night sky, and possibly even the day sky. Of the next hottest class, A, there are four. Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, Vega, Deneb, and Fumahut. Of the next class, F, there are eight, including Procyon. Tantalizingly, the sample included 18 G-type stars, the same class as our Sun, and 38 K-type stars, which some consider potentially more likely to harbor life than the Sun due to their longer lifespan. Of the famous M-type stars, or red dwarfs, there were 249, fully 61% of the total. The sample contained 246 single star systems, 69 binaries, 19 trinaries, 3 quaternaries, and 2 quinaries. In total, multiples comprised 27% of all systems. The sample also included 20 white dwarfs, dim, hot, stellar corpses, and 85 brown dwarfs, though that is almost certainly an underestimate, since Gaia could only detect the dimmest brown dwarfs out to two parsecs. The team cross-referenced the NASA Exoplanets Archive and the Extrasolar Planets Encyclopedia to establish a reliable baseline for the number of confirmed exoplanets. A wise choice, as we shall see later. The team's map will need some explaining. Oh, and um, I know many of my subscribers prefer to listen to my videos rather than watch them, but I'm afraid this one's really going to need your eyes. Like all maps, it is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional structure, in this case, a sphere of stars. The best way to visualize it is as a flattened globe with both sides visible at once. If you see a star on the map that appears out of place, then it is simply on the other side of the globe. Each star is marked with its vertical position, indicating where it falls in 3D space. It is thus advisable to see the two parsec sections as core samples rather than boundary markers. The current official galactic coordinate system defines north and south as distance above or below the galactic plane, similarly to Earth, only squashed. So, when listing a star's vertical position, I will use the terms north and south. If a star lies in the same plane as the Sun, I will use the term in line. The system also places the galactic center as its prime meridian, so anywhere on the map above the galactic center line is west, while anything below is east. Because the galactic center is also the galaxy's center of gravity, I initially planned on calling the direction toward the galactic center down and away up, but decided this would be too confusing, and so instead we'll use the terms coreward and rimward. So, put simply, coreward is right, rimward is left, west is up, east is down, north is out, and south is in. Being our local 10 parsecs, the map shows the local interstellar cloud in all its glory its various subclouds labeled, and its eastern tip pointing toward the Scorpius Centaurus Association. The map also includes two Strumgren spheres, expanding bubbles of ionized gas surrounding the white dwarf Sirius B and Forty Eridani B. All confirmed exoplanets are indicated within a green circle. For this video, and my sanity, I will be focusing my investigations of this map to the innermost two parsec ring of 22 stars. If sufficiently implored, I may make future videos on the surrounding rings. For some reason, the makers of this map chose not to give the stars their most common names, which I will do. So be prepared for discrepancies between what you see and what you hear. The first star should be fairly familiar to most of us. I don't intend to go into too much detail about it, as I will be making several upcoming videos on the topic. Suffice to say, it is a Type G25 Population 1 Yellow Dwarf Star with eight confirmed planets. It would be hard to argue it had a discoverer. Perhaps cyanobacteria? So let's travel a ways rimward of our temperamental dad and visit the first outward system on the map. Two parsecs south, the red dwarf binary Lauten 7268. Willem Jakob Lauten. Side note, I'm assuming that this is the pronunciation of Lauten's name, because he was Dutch. The New York Times had it as Leuten, which is obviously wrong, and Wikipedia has it as Leiten, unsighted, which would make sense given that he emigrated to the U.S. like his similarly Dutch contemporary, Gerard Kuiper. 
But while I have evidence that Kuiper accepted that pronunciation of his name, I have no such evidence for Lauten. So I'm going with Lauten. So anyway, William Jakob Lauten is someone we've been encountering again, so it's best to make his acquaintance now. He was born in Java in 1899, when it was still part of the Dutch East Indies. In 1910, the return of Halley's Comet, which he observed atop his house in Samarang, triggered his fascination with astronomy, and by the time his parents relocated to the Netherlands in 1912, he had already made his first astronomical observations. He attained his PhD at 22, and by 28, he was fluent in nine languages. His advisor was Einar Hersprung, of the famous hersprung russell diagram. But as Lauten noted, the HR diagram was hobbled by its reliance on bright stars, and he determined to make it more representative. In 1925, he decided to dedicate his career to determining the motions of nearby stars, despite being permanently blinded in one eye that same year. He would go on to publish the proper motions of over 200,000 faint stars, nearly 60,000 after he retired. By the 1950s, his work was accelerated by an automated blink comparator, a finding that shocked me because I had assumed blink comparators were automated before then. Sorry, Clyde. So, that digression out of the way, what of the star? As the map notes, Lauten 7268 comprises two gravitationally bound red dwarf stars, named BL Ceti and UV Ceti, that orbit each other at a distance ranging from two to nine astronomical units. The double letter designation indicates that they are of variable brightness, because, like most red dwarfs, they flare. BL's flares are unobtrusive, but UV's are epochal. In 1952, UV Ceti's brightness increased by 7,500% in 20 seconds. So extravagant are its flares that today, flare stars are referred to as UV Ceti type. I dread to imagine what hell any prospective planets may be enduring around such objects, so let's move on. West of Lauten 726 and three parsecs south, we find the solitary red dwarf YZ Ceti, just a shade smaller than Proxima Centauri, and of course, a flare star. It is also a B-Y Draconis variable, meaning that its surface is so pocked with star spots that its light varies with its rotation, which is between two and three times slower than the sun suggesting that YZ is older. The most remarkable thing about YZ SETI is the trio of planets confirmed to be orbiting it, all of which are roughly the mass of the Earth, though with orbital periods of two, three, and four and a half days, far too close to their star to be habitable. Further rimward still, we come to one of the big names in our collection, Tau SETI. In line with YZ SETI and just 1.8 light-years distant from it, Tau Ceti is the closest solitary sun-like star to Earth, present company accepted, of course. I have long wanted to make a video about Tau Ceti, but unfortunately, it refuses to cooperate. One of the most mythically charged stars of the modern era, Tau Ceti is burned through the dreams of scientists and science fiction writers alike, with its promise of connection with another mind across the void. It was one of the first stars targeted by Frank Drake, author of the famous Drake Equation for Project Ozma, the founding search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Sadly, he drew a blank. It would not be the last time that Tau Ceti confounded the search for E.T. While similar to our sun in absolute terms, what fascinates most about Tau Ceti are its differences. It is smaller than the sun, at roughly 80% its mass and radius, and, as the map notes, slightly darker in color though with a surface temperature of 5,400 kelvins, 300 degrees cooler than the sun, it is still hot enough to qualify as G-class. With just 55% the sun's luminosity, Tau Ceti's habitable zone is 0.7 AU, or roughly the orbit of Venus. Tau Ceti appears to be far more stable than the sun. A nine-year study showed no indications of increased solar activity analogous to the sun's 11-year sunspot cycle. So for once, we don't have to worry about flares. Of course, Tau Ceti may simply be going through a mounder minimum, and if so, God help anyone orbiting it. We call the last time the sun went through one of those the Little Ice Age. The most striking difference between Tau Ceti and the sun is in their compositions. Tau Ceti has just 30% the metallicity of the sun. Metallicity being astronomy speak for abundance of elements heavier than hydrogen or helium. 
Because all elements heavier than hydrogen and helium were forged in the cores of stars, the first generation of stars had to die to enrich the next with heavier elements. Thus, stars richer in such elements, like the Sun, are relatively young, meaning Tau Ceti must be substantially older. Estimates for his age have run as high as 10 billion years, though current estimates place it at a more modest 5.8 billion, which is still a third older than the Sun. But a star can only tell us so much. For life, we need planets. And here Tau Ceti played us again. In December 2012, a globe-spanning team announced the potential discovery of five planets around Tau Ceti, all super-Earths between 1.75 and 4 Earth masses. Unfortunately, a follow-up paper in 2017 only managed to confirm two of them, Tau Ceti e, a 4 Earth mass object about half an AU from its star, and Tau Ceti f, a 4 Earth mass object at about 1.3 AU, or roughly the orbit of Mars. You may have noticed, however, that this map does not include them, because they fall outside its certainty boundaries. What's even more frustrating is that even if they do exist, neither E or F, despite approaching Tau Ceti's 0.7 AU habitable zone, are expected to be habitable themselves. E is too warm, and is likely like Venus. F is too cold, and probably resembles Mars. Sadly, it is what we do know orbits Tau Ceti that has most soured its prospects for life. In 2004, a team led by Jane Greaves, the same astronomer who identified that troublesome phosphine in Venus's atmosphere last year, identified a gigantic ring of debris around Tau Ceti, three times as wide as our own Kuiper belt and housing ten times as much material. This gargantuan celestial scrap heap was a surprise given Tau Ceti's low metallicity and suggests that our solar system's relatively anemic Kuiper belt may be the exception rather than the rule. Such a swarm of world-ending missiles, while not ruling out the possibility of life, would certainly accelerate the rate of mass extinctions. Tau Ceti, in 70 years you've gone from a promise to a warning. And yet, somehow, I still believe in you. If there is life in you, we will know soon enough. The next wave of telescopes, such as the James Webb, the Vera Rubin, and the Nancy Roman, should settle the issue one way or the other. Here's to the search. Just east of Tau Ceti, and two parsecs north of the sun, lies the solitary red dwarf Lalande 21185. Yes, you heard that right. Lalande 21185. Now, to be clear, this red dwarf which is about twice the size of Proxima Centauri, is unlikely to literally be the 21,185th star personally located by the 18th century French astronomer Joseph Jérôme Lefrançois de Lalande. Rather, it appears in his published star catalogue, Histoire Céleste Française, the largest and most complete star catalogue of its time, totaling 47,000 measured stars. It was the result of a massive collective effort of the staff of the Paris Observatory of which Lalande was director from 1795 until 1800, succeeding the much-put-upon Dominique Cassini, who had abandoned astronomy in frustration after the revolution put a target on his head. Lalande had fared the terror more securely than Cassini, in part because he changed his last name from the aristocratic-sounding La Francois to Lalande, and also because, despite contemplating a clerical life at an early age, he was an atheist who was able to impress the viciously anti-clerical revolutionaries with the value of scientific education. Many joked that his atheism was his revenge against God for making him so ugly. While he contributed to the vein-popping effort to calculate the return of Halley's Comet in 1759, and published several well-regarded books on astronomy and other topics, he is best known today for not discovering Neptune. In 1795, he, or his nephew, Noted a star appear to change position, but the observation was dutifully scrapped as human error and forgotten, and only uncovered in the 20th century. Lalande likely never gave a second glance to his star, either. Its high proper motion, and thus its proximity to ourselves, was not noted for half a century. And in most respects, Lalande's star is a fairly typical red dwarf. Low metallicity, though not spectacularly so, blemish with star spots, and while officially classified as a flare star, 
fairly quiescent by Red Dwarf standards. And of course, it's a solitary nearby Red Dwarf, so there's the mandatory saga of planets. In the 1960s, Peter van de Kamp announced that he had found a planet orbiting it, not realizing he had fallen afoul of the same faulty telescope that had led him to declare a planet around Barnard's star. Ironically, the man who disproved van de Kamp's claims, George Gatewood, would go on to create a fracas of his own by declaring he'd found not one, but multiple planets around Lalande, a claim that to date no one has been able to replicate. Further studies found nothing, but in an uncharacteristically happy end to the story, in 2020, a radio velocity search revealed a planet with a mass of about two and a half times Earth's and an orbital period of just 12 days. Too close an orbit to be habitable, I'm afraid. Now, to reach our next star, we must travel many light years eastward, slightly coreward, and one parsec north. We've learned something from following this map. Actual stars are not unlike metaphorical stars. Some are known globally, loved, worshipped, and offered endorsement deals, while others make do with cult followings, known and appreciated by a very specific audience. For no star is this more true than Wolf 359. Upon hearing that name, I imagine that for most of you, the reaction was something along the lines of, hmm, cool name. But if you're a Trekkie, the name Wolf 359 opens an entire library of history and tragedy that ripples across time. For it was at this system that the Federation suffered its crushing defeat to the Boer Collective, a cataclysm that reshaped Trek history even to this day. So what is it? And how did it get such a badass name? Well, as a star, Wolf 359 is actually quite remarkable in its unremarkability. At just 9% the mass of the Sun, it is smaller even than Proxima Centauri, and more than twice as dim. If it were just 22% smaller, it wouldn't be a star at all. Its radius is just 45% larger than Jupiter's. Its surface temperature, of just 2800 kelvins, is low enough for actual chemistry to occur on its surface. Its atmosphere shows traces of iron hydride, carbon monoxide, and even water. In that sense, it might be best not to think of Wolf 359 as a star, but as a particularly hot planet. In another sense, though, Wolf 359 has a greater claim to starhood than the Sun, since, unlike our capricious parent, Wolf's small mass means that it is fully convective, and so will be generating fusion at its core for at least eight trillion years. Long after our Sun is a burnt, fading cinder. No planets have been found around it so far, though two planets were tentatively identified in 2019, a super-Earth of about four Earth masses, and a gas giant about half the size of Saturn, but also no evidence of a debris disk, which means any planets are likely safer for mass extinctions than we are. As to the name, well, it belongs to Max Wolf. Actually, Maximilian Franz Joseph Cornelius Wolf, which is itself a fairly badass name. Active during the turn of the 19th and 20th century, he was one of the first astronomers to employ cameras in his searches. He spent his entire life, from birth to death, in the German city of Heidelberg, which is fairly remarkable given the average state of German skies. He discovered his first comet before he graduated college, and was the first person to observe Halley on its return in 1910, much to the disappointment of his longtime friend and competitor, E.E. E. Barnard. He supervised the construction of the observatory at the University of Heidelberg, including the first ever public planetarium. His use of cameras revolutionized astronomy. Of the 861 asteroids discovered between 1891 and 1931, Wolf's observatory found 523. Among them was 588 Achilles, the first known Trojan asteroid, a class of asteroids trapped in Jupiter's L4 and L5 points. This technique was also ideal for fixing the proper motions of dim stars, of which Wolf would eventually catalogue over a thousand. Still eastward, and one parsec north, we come to one of the most intriguing of our near neighbours, Ross 128. About the size of Proxima Centauri, but twice as bright and nowhere near as flary, Ross 128 offers one of the best prospects for life of any red dwarf in our local neighbourhood. It even lacks an infrared excess, indicating that it isn't surrounded by a particularly large debris disk. Its low metallicity, roughly the same as Barnard's star, and slow rotation period 
of about 165 days mean that it is very old, possibly as old as 10 billion years. But the most remarkable thing about Ross 128 is the planet detected in orbit around it in 2017. At its distance from its star, Ross 128b only receives about 38% more sunlight than Earth, compared with 91% more for Venus. It is also only 35% more massive than Earth, making it one of the closest Earth analogs among our nearest stars. Unlike Proxima b, there hasn't been as much speculative modeling of whatever potential climate 128 might have, which is surprising given that its climate is far more likely than Proxima b's to be temperate. Oh, and if you're wondering about its discoverer, Frank Elmore Ross, well, there really isn't that much to say about him. Born in California in 1874, he ended up at Yerkes, plotted the orbits for a few moons, worked for Kodak for a while where he learned to take better photographs, did follow-up work on E.E. E. Barnard's star searches, and as a result, found a lot of stars. He appears to have had a typical star hunter's personality, stubborn, focused, and resistant to boredom. Next stop, G.L. Virginis. It's Proxima Centauri, basically. Next stop, and far more interesting, is Lumen 16, a brown dwarf binary discovered only in 2013, and the first point in our journey discovered by someone who is still alive. Lumen 16 is directly in line with the Sun, and its third closest system, after Alpha Centauri and Barnard's star. The reason it took so long to find, despite being so close, is that it lies very near the plane of the Milky Way, and was smothered by the surrounding swarm of stars. Its two comprising objects are, respectively, 34 and 29 Earth masses, and orbit each other every 27 years at a distance of roughly 3.6 AU, which would place them between the Sun and the asteroid belt in our system. Age estimates place the system at around the same age as our Sun. There have been some, perhaps, overly optimistic searches for planets in the system, but subsequent observations have pretty much ruled them out. Observations with the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in 2013 has shown that Lumen B has a mottled surface with both dark and light patches, while the same telescope showed in 2020 that A's atmosphere is banded, like Jupiter's. Kevin Lumen's work with the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, the infrared space telescope whose primary mission ran between 2009 and 2011, discovered not just this eponymous system, but the fourth closest system as well, a fascinating object that unfortunately doesn't lie within this particular circle. West of Lumen 16 and four parsecs north, we find the red dwarf binary Wolf 424. The two stars, just slightly larger than Proxima Centauri, orbit each other at a distance of about 4 AU, and of course, are flare stars. West and coreward of Wolf 424, and in line with the Sun, we finally arrive at the poster child for our stellar neighborhood, Alpha Centauri. The triple star system is the closest system to our own, at just 4.4 light years as the laser beam flies, and comprises the double star of Alpha Centauri A and B, two sun like stars that orbit each other every 80 years, and Proxima Centauri, a small red dwarf that orbits the pair every 550,000 years at a distance of about 9,000 AU. So loosely is Proxima tied to Alpha Centauri that for many years it was doubted whether it orbited at all. It was only in 2017 that precise radial velocity measurements finally clinched that it was, in fact, gravitationally bound. I have already discussed Proxima at length in several videos at this point, and so will not be doing so here. Please click on the playlist if you'd like to see more. Alpha A and B orbit each other at a distance of 17.6 AU, which is slightly closer than Uranus and the Sun, though their orbit is highly eccentric, with a periastron of 11 AU, which is slightly farther than Saturn, and an apastron of 35.6 AU, or about the distance to Pluto. The pair are almost aspiringly sun-like, with A 10% more massive than the Sun, and B 10% less, the three could form a comedy lineup. Interjection. In 2016, the IAU respectively named Alpha Centauri A and B, Rigil Kentaurus, the centaur's foot in Arabic slash Greek, and Ptolemon, a word derived from the Arabic at meaning the two ostriches. Ptolemon, I don't mind much, but I have to ask, I hear you, was Rigil Kentaurus your first choice? I mean, they're in Alpha Centauri. We know that's in Centaurus. 
and we already have a Rigel. I couldn't put this on my list of names I want to change, because I couldn't come up with an alternative. So from here on out, I'll be referring to B as Toleman, and A as Jilly. Jilly is actually the exact same class as the Sun, G25, while Toleman is a cooler, darker K-type. Determining the age of stars is always tricky, but estimates suggest the duo are about the same age as, or slightly older than, the Sun. Jilly is about 22% larger than the Sun in diameter, but still of its homey yellow color. Its surface shows a similar level of solar activity to the Sun, although it recently saw a massive decline in activity, which, depending on how long it lasts, could either be a particularly long solar minimum, or something more akin to the Sun's mounder minimum, a decline in sunspots lasting hundreds of years. Toleman, while smaller than Jilly, at 86% the Sun's diameter, appears to be more active, with more X-ray emissions and a shorter solar cycle, just eight years, compared to the Sun's 11. In about 25,000 years, the system will reach its closest point to the Sun, at just 2.9 light-years. But of course, we don't want to hear about the stars. The real question is, and has always been, where are the planets? Well, when it comes to Alpha Centauri, at least the big two, that answer is complicated. In 2012, a team of European astronomers thought they detected a planet around Ptolemy. Sadly, it turned out to be a data artifact. In 2013, a second exoplanet was briefly seen transiting Ptolemy's surface, its shadow suggesting an Earth-sized planet with a roasting 20-day orbit. It has yet to be confirmed. And finally, in 2020, a team in the Breakthrough Watch Initiative the gargantuan private SETI project funded by Russian tycoon Yuri Milner, may have directly imaged a planet around Jilly, a super-Earth about twice the mass of Neptune smack dab in Jilly's habitable zone. However, it too has yet to be confirmed, and voices are whispering that it, like its predecessor, may be a data artifact. It would be a violation of the rightness of the universe, the Alpha Centauri system proves barren. For the future of humanity and the science fiction genre, we must keep looking. Westward of Alpha Centauri and four parsecs south, we come to the red dwarf, Gliese 1. It takes a certain quality to pursue the cataloging of stars. Tenacity isn't quite the right word, as that implies ceaseless struggle against all odds. Rather, it would be better described as a kind of bloody-minded doggedness that supersedes all human needs or desires. Again and again in researching the lives of those whose names adorn these stars, I find stories of pupils and comrades falling to the wayside from exhaustion as their master relentlessly ticked each box, noted each element, and logged each position, then moved on, hour after hour, week after week, year after year. Perhaps the greatest exemplar of this personality was Wilhelm Gliese the German astronomer whose life encapsulates the worst period of the 20th century. Born in Prussia in 1915, as a student in Berlin, he quickly found a home in the Astronomical Calculations Institute. Then, in 1942, he was conscripted into the Wehrmacht and sent to the Eastern Front, where the Nazis sent troops to die. Taken as a prisoner of war in 1945, he was not released until 1949, whereupon he went straight back to his job and, in 1957, published his first catalogue of nearby stars, supplementing it in 1969, 1979, and 1991, two years before he died. So if you've ever wondered why every nearby star you've heard of has his name on it, that's why. And as for Gliese 1? Well, it's fairly large for a red dwarf, fully 40% the sun's mass and radius. In fact, if it were much larger, it wouldn't be a red dwarf. Still, like virtually all red dwarfs, it is dusted with star spots and flares. Several planet searches have so far turned up nothing. What truly makes Gliese 1 interesting is that it is a runaway star. It has a relatively high motion through the galaxy, which suggests that it was kicked out of its birth cluster by a collision, or perhaps a supernova. Coreward of Gliese 1, and fully 9 par 6 north, we come to Gliese 526 a fairly typical red dwarf of no current note, but, slightly to the west and eight parsecs back down, we arrive at Lakaya 9352. It appears I have a bone to pick with the Abbe Nicolas Louis de Lacaille, 
for it was he who, on a trip to the Cape of Good Hope in 1750, colonized the southern sky. His observations of over 10,000 southern stars required the invention of 14 constellations, which, I'm sad to say, became standard. His constellations, which were seemingly named after whatever he had lying around, have the distinction of not bearing even the slightest resemblance to what they are meant to depict. Nakaya thought this was a microscope, this was a compass, and this was a pendulum. Anyway, is the star interesting? As a star, not really. It is again a fairly large red dwarf, about half the diameter of the sun, and has the distinction of being the first red dwarf to have its diameter directly measured. What does make it interesting are the two planets found orbiting it in 2020, super-Earths of four and five Earth masses respectively, both too close to fall within the star's habitable zone. A third signal detected may indicate a planet farther out, but it hasn't been confirmed. Rimward and four parsecs south of Lakaya, and fully seven parsecs south of the Sun, we find Gliese 2005, a trinary red dwarf system about which I can find no useful information whatsoever. Two parsecs further south, and thus almost at the edge of the sphere, we find the sun-like star Beta Come Bernices, which, despite being a naked-eye star in a constellation established in 300 BC, appears to have no traditional name. It is slightly larger and brighter than the Sun, but still within its G-class. It has a higher metallicity than the Sun, suggesting it is younger, with astronomers placing its age as between 1 and 2 billion years. And that's it, pretty much. It has a similar solar cycle to the Sun, and no planets or debris have been detected orbiting it. Coreward, slightly west, and back in line with the Sun, we come to Barnard's star. Oh boy. I really was hoping not to have to talk about Barnard's star in this video. If you recall, I made a rather substantial video on the star and its discoverer, the redoubtable E.E. E. Barnard, some years ago. In that video, I noted that a team of Spanish and German astronomers had, with, and I quote, 99% certainty, detected a planet around Barnard's star. Not only did I make a video about it, I listed it as the most fascinating astronomical discovery of 2018, as you would for a discovery with 99% certainty. This year, a week ago as of writing, a team using the Habitable Zone Planet Finder at McDonald Observatory in Texas, side note, why am I only now finding out about something called the Habitable Zone Planet Finder, have determined, so they claim, that the 233-day wobble the European team detected was in fact a transitory signal that only appeared continuous because it happened to show up during the times when the team were observing. You would think that would be the sort of error one would account for before declaring 99% certainty, but I digress. I'm not taking down the video, by the way. Most of it isn't about the planet, and Barnard's star almost certainly has a planetary system, whether it resembles the one in that video or not, simply because it is old enough to have one. This marks the second time Barnard's star has tricked the eyes of exoplanet hunters. If anyone's going for round three, they'd better have numbers better than 99%. West of Barnard's star, and two parsecs south, we get to one of the best-named stars in the cosmos, EZ Aquarii. Also known as Lauten 7896, EZ Aquarii is a trinary system of three red dwarfs. Two, A and B, orbiting each other at the scarily tight distance of 0.03 AU, a revolution that takes under four days, and a third red dwarf, C, that orbits the pair every 823 days. Astoundingly, for such a pinball configuration, it is not impossible for a habitable planet to exist in a circumbinary orbit around A and B, though no planets have been found in the system as of yet. West of EZ Aquarii and 10 parsecs north, we find Ross 1015, a red dwarf of so little interest that I can find no information about it. Rimward of that, and 12 parsecs south, we find Liza 1002, a red dwarf of little note except that it is one of the few nearby red dwarfs that is apparently not a flare star. East of that, we find Gliese 1005, a binary system of two Proxima S stars. East of that, we get to Egger 246 the only white dwarf in the innermost ring. 
It is not, however, the closest white dwarf to Earth, since at nine parsecs south of the Sun, it actually resides near the edge of the sphere. Its spectral type indicates that it has a carbon-rich atmosphere, but more interesting is its name. The E in Egger stands for Egen, as in Olin Juk Egen, the astronomer most famous these days for running off to Chile with the only historical record of the British attempt to discover Neptune, and lying that he didn't have it till the day he died, even as he kept it in a strong box in his house. Finally, we have Gliese 1028, another red dwarf about which I can find no useful information. And that's it. That's the entire inner circle. Sorry to end it on a whimper, but if this video goes down well, I may move on to the outward rings. I swear, this map screws with your head. 22 stars in and we haven't even gotten to Sirius yet. Heck, we haven't even gotten to the fourth closest system to Earth. If you'd like me to cover some of the better known stars in the next ring, or if you'd prefer I do something completely different, please let me know and like, comment, subscribe and all that. Someday, in the aftertime, when books are again free to humanity, I will progress on my promised videos. Until then, stay curious, fellow seekers. I mean, 99% certainty, I mean, come on. <laughs>